Jesus didn't begin his earthly life in a manger. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit within the womb of a young, unmarried virgin who was not planning to be with child. The creator of the cosmos and sustainer of all things became the size of a single human cell. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Like all human beings before and after his appearing, the eternal Son of God underwent every stage of human development. He was an embryo, he was a fetus, and he became a baby. He emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being made in human likeness, to give light to those who sit in darkness, bring life and immortality to light through the gospel, to reconcile sinners to God, and guide our feet in the way of peace. Emmanuel, God with us, entered the womb to redeem the world. The one place our culture believes it is permissible to murder another human being was the place that God chose to be his entrance into our world. The incarnation of Christ thus stands in direct conflict with our culture's practice of abortion. And to celebrate Christmas is to be in conflict with the culture of death. Luke chapter 1, verses 68 through 79, is what we're going to look at today. Specifically, we're going to zero in on verses 74 through 79 in Luke chapter 1. And to remind us, or maybe to teach you for the first time, these set of verses are a song by a man named Zechariah. And Zechariah is the father of John the Baptist a little bit better known figure than Zechariah. He served as a priest in the temple, and an angel came to Zechariah and said, your wife, who is old and barren, is going to have a child. And Zechariah basically responded in unbelief and said, well, how's that going to happen? And so then the Lord struck him with muteness and made him dumb. That means he could not speak for the rest of of the pregnancy, and until John, his son, was born. And as soon as John is born and they bring it to him, Zechariah writes down on a piece of paper that his name is John. And as soon as he does that, the Lord opens his mouth, enables him to speak again, and the very first thing he does, after being mute for maybe nine months, somewhere around there, is praise the Lord. He sings a song of praise to the Lord. Look at verse 68 in Luke chapter 1, and notice at the very beginning, this sets up everything that he's going to say, and he says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. Blessed be the Lord God means praise be ascribed to the Lord God of Israel. So blessed be the Lord God means Praise be to the Lord God. Not like we can give a blessing to God, but we bless his name, we praise his name. So that's what Zechariah's song begins with. And then the very next word, after praise be to the Lord God of Israel, the next word is for, which means because. And so this entire song is... The reason you and I should and must praise the Lord. That's the whole point of this passage. Praise the Lord because he sent Jesus to rescue us. That's the whole point. Everything he talks about is the Lord Jesus coming to the earth. He is the eternal God who took on flesh and became a human being to come and look at it in your own Bible. Visit and redeem his people. And everything else is an explanation of that. And then in verse 75, we actually get to, or actually verse 76 rather, Zechariah starts singing about his baby John, who is to be the prophet that will prepare the way for Christ, the Messiah, the Savior, the King. But all of it has to do with Jesus coming to the earth visiting his people to redeem us, 
to buy us back from slavery to Satan, sin, and death in order that we would worship him in spirit and in truth. So the point of this song, praise God because Jesus brings joy. Or you could flip it around. Jesus brings joy, therefore, praise God. So you are commanded. Look at me in my eyes. You are created and commanded to worship God. You're not created to do whatever you want to do. You exist to ascribe glory and honor and praise in the way that you live your life and in the way that you sing, the way that you talk, the way that you would gather for worship like this. You exist to worship God. So this passage should be really insightful for you and me, for everyone that exists, in fact, because we have worshiped the Lord because of all these things. So we have all the ammunition that we pack in our barrel to shoot out in praise and worship of the Lord. You should really want to memorize these verses and you should look at the word halfway through verse 68 when he says for and make sure you understand that means because worship the Lord because of all these things. Now in verses 68 through 73 let me just rapid fire these to you and remind you if you weren't with us last week in worship you may not realize all these things we already covered. We're, we're taking two weeks to look at this song. But let, rem, let me remind you of the first seven things that we saw in this passage. And then we'll get to number eight. There's 14 reasons in this passage that you and I should, must praise the Lord. Praise the Lord because of these things. So here we go. Here's, here's the first one. In verse 68, the second half, we must praise the Lord because Christ has visited and redeemed his people. Second, we must praise the Lord because Christ is the horn of salvation for us. That's verse 69. Third, we must praise the Lord because Christ is the promised forever king. That's the second half of verse 69 and verse 70. Fourth, we must praise the Lord because Christ saves us from our enemies and all who hate us. That's verse 71. Fifth, we must praise the Lord because Christ shows promised mercy to tired saints. That's the first part of verse 72. Sixth, we must praise the Lord because Christ seals the holy covenant by shedding his blood. That's the second part of verse 72 and the first part of verse 73. And seventh, we must praise the Lord because Christ delivered us to worship him without fear. We must praise the Lord because Christ delivered us to worship him without fear. That's the end of verse 73 and the beginning of verse 74. So there, there's the point. Here's where we're at. You must worship the Lord because of these things. Let's consider now verse 74 and verse 75 the number or the eighth thing that we see in this passage through Zechariah's song is that we must praise the Lord because Christ saves us to worship him in holiness and righteousness. Holiness and righteousness is how we worship him. Look at verse 74 and 75 again. Remember, the whole thing is, blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for, because, verse 74, that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, 
So God delivers us through the work of Christ from the hand of our enemies, Satan, sin, death, so that we might serve him without fear. The word serve is a worship word. It means that we may worship him without fear. And notice, verse 75, he's explaining what he has in mind, what God has in mind as he's speaking through Zechariah, even in this song of praise. How do we worship God without fear? Verse 75 says, in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. We must praise the Lord because Christ saves us to worship him in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. Psalm 29 verse 2. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Psalm 29, 2. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord arrayed in, clothed in, in the splendor of holiness. The way that you worship the Lord is not only in public worship or in family worship or in private worship, the way you worship the Lord and the way you must worship Him is by living your life in holiness and righteousness. That is how we worship the Lord, in the splendor of holiness. That's what the psalmist means when he says, Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Worship the Lord clothed in holiness. That means two things for you. You must, first of all, be clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You must have faith in Jesus and what he's done for despicable rebels like you and me. And trust in his work on the cross, in his life perfectly obeying the law of God trusting in what he's done for sinners like us, and so that God would then clothe you in Jesus' righteousness. He takes your sin away, he clothes you with the holiness of Jesus, and so you worship the Lord in the way that you live, in the way that you sing, in the way that you talk, in the way that you give, in all of life, you would worship the Lord, first of all, clothed with the holiness of Jesus in your place. That's the first thing that it means. The second thing it means is that you must, having been counted righteous before God by the grace of God through faith in Jesus, you must live in holiness and righteousness. God has counted you holy and righteous because of what Christ has done for you, and therefore you must walk in holiness And righteousness. And that is how you glorify and worship the Lord. God is glorified as you, by the strength that God provides, say no to sin, yes to righteousness, and you take every thought captive to the Word of God in order to obey Jesus Christ. That's how you worship the Lord. Or as Paul says in Romans 12, Offer your bodies as a living killing, as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to the Lord, for this is your only reasonable service or worship. That's what it means. Offer your bodies as a living dying. That means every day you're laying down on the altar saying, Lord, kill my sin, kill my selfishness, kill my desires. I crucify the flesh along with its desires so that I may serve you, worship you in the way that I live my life. You must praise the Lord 
because Jesus has delivered you to worship him in those ways. And the only way you are going to worship the Lord in holiness and in righteousness is if God has delivered you from sin and death, put his spirit in you, and is promising to strengthen you every day so that you can continue to worship him in holiness and righteousness. Do you see that this Zechariah is saying, this is why you must praise the Lord? Because he delivered you from the hand of your enemies so that you may serve him, worship him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all your days. That's a reason to worship God. It's not only a command that you must, you should worship God for the fact that you even can worship the Lord in holiness and in righteousness. Thomas Boston, in his sermon that he preached in 1721, called Serving the Lord in Holiness, he points out that in, in this verse, when Zechariah sings this, it's like, why does he say holiness and righteousness? Aren't those synonyms? Don't they mean the same thing? And Boston, I think, may be right when he says, what you should think of when he says, serve the Lord in holiness, is the first table of the Ten Commandments. That has to deal with how you worship and serve God. And he says, when he says righteousness, you should think of the second table of the Ten Commandments when it has to deal with how you love your neighbor as yourself. So you want to think, how do I serve the Lord in holiness? Worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. How do I serve and worship the Lord in righteousness? Love your neighbor as yourself. This is how God is glorified in your life. That you worship and serve him in holiness and righteousness. Do you want to be truly happy? Children, look at me. Do you want to be happy? I want to be happy. It is not a bad thing for you to want to be happy. Children, God created you so that you would be happy. And if you want to be happy, you must be holy. And children, what that means is that your life is obedient to what God has said in his word. That's what holiness looks like. You worship the Lord only. You say, what does Jesus say? I want to obey Jesus. Adults, do you want to be happy? You must be holy. You must, first of all, be clothed in the holiness of Jesus Christ, who, was, who lived without sin so that you'd be counted righteous, who died in place of sinners so that your iniquity would be taken away. You must be counted holy first. If you truly want to be happy, there is no true happiness outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, crucified and trusted. You must trust in Christ if you want to be happy. Now, do you want to be continually happy? Then you must make it your aim to live in holiness and righteousness every day of your life. If you don't want to be happy, then don't worry about holiness. You don't want God to be glorified through you? Don't worry about holiness then. But if you want to be happy, you want to live for how God's created you to live, you must make it your business to be holy as he is holy. Indeed, we must praise the Lord because Christ saves us to worship him in holiness and righteousness. Holiness is the cool older brother of happiness. 
Wherever holiness goes, happiness is sure to tag along, even if he's not invited. If you want to be happy, you must be holy. Happiness will follow holiness. Look to Christ and be counted holy before God, and then look to Christ for strength to live holy before God all your days. There's the eighth reason we must praise the Lord. He saves us to worship him in holiness and righteousness. Don't tell me Christ has saved you so that you can continue to live in unholiness. Christ has not saved you so that you can continually make peace with sin and death. He has saved you so that you would no longer live for yourself, but you would live for him who for your sake died and was raised. He's delivered us so that we would worship him in holiness and righteousness. Ninth, we must praise the Lord because Christ had prophets, such as John the Baptist, who prepared his ways. That's one of the reasons you should praise the Lord. Because Christ had prophets before Christ came who were preparing his ways. And the culmination of all the prophets in the Old Testament was John the Baptist. He is the last Old Testament prophet. He's the last in the line of all these prophets of God that were pointing to the Messiah, the Lord Jesus. And that's a reason that you should praise God. Look at verse 76. Zechariah, talking to his own son, John, who he knows will be this promised prophet, says, And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways. What is Zechariah saying? How can he with such certainty say that his son John is the prophet who is to prepare the ways of the Lord? That's because he knew his Bible. And the angel had promised him that his son would be the prophet that was promised in Isaiah 40. So all Zechariah is doing is trusting what the Lord had said and looking to Isaiah chapter 40 and realizing, oh snap, that's my son? My son's going to be the prophet to prepare the ways of the Lord? Listen to this, Isaiah chapter 40. Verses 3 and 5. A voice cries. In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Verse 5. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. That's John the Baptist's ministry. All of the evangelists who wrote the gospel accounts, they point to John, this John, the son of Zechariah, that was just born at this time that Zechariah sings this song. Isaiah 40 promised what this prophet would come and do. And then when John came, he grew up and he was a weird homeschool kid who lived in the wilderness and ate locusts and honey and prepared the ways of the Lord. This is John's ministry. He's the last in the line of the Old Testament prophets who prepares the way for Jesus to come. And so when Jesus comes on the scene, everyone is primed and ready to receive him and trust in him to take their sin away and be their king. That's John's ministry. You will be called prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord. So before Jesus comes, John's ministry starts, and John is preparing his ways. So Jesus comes onto the scene, and everyone's ready to repent and believe the gospel of the kingdom of God. This was the job of all the prophets. It wasn't only the job of John the Baptist to prepare the ways of the Lord, you look through the entirety of your Bible in the Old Testament and all of the prophets, their job 
was to prepare the way for the Messiah. Every one of them. You should never read anything in your Bible in its entirety. Nothing in here is not pointing to Jesus. Everything in here is pointing to the Lord Jesus. All of the prophets were preparing the way of the Lord, and John is the last in that long line of godly men. He's the one that is the forerunner. He goes right in before Jesus. He was promised to enter human history through the womb of the virgin in order to rescue his people from their sins and miseries. All the prophets of the Most High who wrote the Old Testament, all they are is but the opening acts of the concert of redemption in history. If you've ever been to a concert, Typically, there's a headliner, there's the main band you want to go see, or the main performer you want to see, and they have opening acts. And if they're a good opening act, they say, who's ready to see the the person you came to see? Who's ready to see? And all the prophets in the Old Testament, they are saying specific things to specific people, but the ultimate thing the prophets are saying is, Who's ready to see Jesus? And all of us say, that's why we've come. The apostles in the New Testament, who wrote the New Testament of the Scriptures, all they are is the hype men on the stage, throwing around towels, saying, Jesus is King! Jesus is King! All the prophets are doing is saying, Who's ready to see Jesus? And all the apostles are doing is saying, Look at Jesus! That's your whole Bible. The Old Testament prophets prepared the way, culminating with John, and the New Testament apostles pointed to the one who came. That's your whole Bible. Yet I want you to consider how John the Baptist prepared people for Jesus. How did John the Baptist do that? I mean, this passage seems so positive, right? Zechariah, and you, child, shall be prophet of the Most High. You will prepare the ways of the Lord. And then John becomes an adult and starts his ministry in the wilderness, and people are going out to hear him in the wilderness. And remember, this is the one that the Lord chose to, and the Lord put his words in John the Baptist's mouth. And these are the words that the Lord wants spoken in order to prepare you and me and everyone else to receive Jesus Christ as our Savior and King. This is what John says, Luke 3, 7-9. Luke writes, John said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers. There's an exclamation point there. That's why I can yell. He doesn't say, oh, you brood of vipers. No, Luke is an investigative reporter who went and got all the eyewitness accounts of everyone that saw everything that happened, and he wrote it down for us. And when he says, What was John the Baptist's ministry like? The eyewitnesses said, well, the first thing he said to us was, we're a bunch of snakes. You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? That's how John prepared the way of the Lord. Verse 8. Bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. He's saying, don't begin to say, well, you know, I came from a Christian home. I'm a very moral person. But for the immediate context, it was, well, I'm a Jew. Abraham is my father. So I'm, one, I'm in the covenant of God's people. John says, don't you dare 
lay claim to your Jewish ancestry. That's what he says. When don't you, do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. And then John says, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cast down and thrown into the fire. You want to prepare people to receive Jesus and to know that they must have Jesus as their Savior? That's what John was prepared to do. And that's what the Lord put in John's mouth to speak. And the first thing out of his mouth was, You snakes. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? What do we learn from that? We learn at least that if you are going to be properly prepared to turn from your sin and trust in Jesus, indeed, if anyone is going to be properly prepared, their sin must be pointed out. The gospel is not, God loves you. Jesus died for you. That's not the gospel. The gospel is, you have rebelled against your creator and you are owed nothing but death, hell, and the wrath of God. And Jesus came to deliver us. Jesus came and sacrificed himself so that we could be saved if we turn to him in faith. We obey him. We submit to him. This is how John prepared the way. And you must praise the Lord for his prophets who point out and say, The Lord will by no means clear the guilty. You bunch of snakes. You should praise the Lord for prophets in your Bible that prepare the way of the Lord like that. You must be dealt a deadly blow. Or you will never look to Christ for salvation from the sin that has earned you death. You must be dealt a deadly blow. Now look at me. Has God dealt you individually? Has God dealt you a deadly blow? So that you know my only hope and in life, in life and in death is Jesus Christ. Has God said to you in your heart something along the same lines as John? You snake. You are like your father, the devil. Has God said something like that in your own heart so that you know outside of Christ, all I am is a sinner that deserves the wrath of God? The only thing I have earned is death. Has God dealt you that deadly blow? Do you know you're a sinner on your own, outside of Jesus Christ, all you've got to offer God is the sin that you need to be saved from? I'm not talking about do you know that here. I'm talking about do you know that here. That's the deadly blow that you must be dealt and it will kill your self-righteousness. It will kill your selfishness so that you will run to Jesus Christ and trust in him alone. That's how you need to be prepared to receive the Christ. That's how John the Baptist prepared all of us to receive the one who takes away the sin of the world. The deadly tumor must be identified before you will trust the doctor to cut it out. Do you know that on your own, all you've got is the tumor? If you've never known that, then you've never gone to the doctor. You've never gone to Jesus if you don't know that you have great need to be saved. Beloved, pull back and remember, we must praise the Lord because he 
had prophets such as John prepare his ways. Tenth, look at verse 77. We must praise the Lord because Christ brings salvation to his people. And here's how it goes. The deadly blow, you brood of vipers. John prepares the way by pointing out that we have a great need to be saved. And then what John is also revealing is knowledge of salvation. God is revealing this to his people. His people? It's like Zechariah sounds like a Calvinist. Well, no, Calvinists sound like the Bible. To bring the knowledge of salvation to God's people. Yes, his people. This is revealed to us in the scripture that Jesus came to save his sheep. That's revealed to you and to me so that if we trust in the Lord Jesus, we would know before the foundation of the earth, God picked me. God wants you to know that. He wants you to know that the Lord Jesus did not come to potentially save people. He wants you to know that if you trust in Jesus now, or if you would go to him in faith, that God sent his only son to save you, not to simply make it possible for you to be saved. He gives the knowledge of salvation to his people. In this first instance, it's to the Jews in the first century, but the broader point is that Christ came to save his sheep. Look at me. Jeremiah Burroughs points out that when there were transactions made between the father and the son, we're told that the father has given a people to the son, and then the son came to purchase the people, and then the spirit comes to make those people alive and apply that redemption to them. Burroughs says, when these transactions were made between the father and the son to redeem You were mentioned by name. Can you even think about that? That's what it means that Jesus came to redeem his people. Is that before the foundation of the earth. The Lord God said, I'm going to redeem Brett. That's not arrogant. That leads us to fall on our face and worship. Why did you save me? Why did you speak my name? Because I wanted to. Because I wanted to love you. Because I'm glorified as I take despicable people like you. And I set my love on them. And I redeem them. And I pay the bill for it. We must praise the Lord because Christ brings salvation to his people. Specifically, Zechariah is singing about the fact that John the Baptist is the means by which God is bringing that knowledge of salvation to his people. Jesus is bringing the salvation. John is preparing the way by making it known and so that God's people would come to have the knowledge of salvation. Oh, how we need that. Can you think with me for a minute? Do you remember at one time in your life when you did not have the knowledge of salvation? Do you remember when you you used to not know that you could stand before God clothed with the perfect righteousness of the Lord Jesus and that God would say, I accept you for Christ's sake? Do you remember the time in your life that you didn't even know what imputed righteousness meant? You didn't know that God would give me Jesus' righteousness so that when God looks at me, he would see Jesus' perfection? 
Do you remember when you didn't know that? Do you remember when you didn't know that if you're in Christ, God is actually pleased with you for Christ's sake? Do you remember when you used to think every time you sinned that God is up in heaven just waiting to squash you like a bug? Do you remember when you used to think that? And you used to not want to sin, maybe, because you were just fearful that God would kill you. You remember when you used to think like that? You may say, I never thought like that. You're a liar. You did think like that. I know you did. Because we all think like that before God saves us. Do you remember when you used to think, I can't let go of this sin that I'm clinging so tight to? Look at me in my eyes. Do you remember when you used to think, I can't let go of this sin that I cling so tight to because you thought it would make you happier than Jesus? But now, if you are in Christ, God has given you the knowledge of salvation. And this is not merely talking about an intellectual knowledge. This is talking about something that goes into your soul. I know that despite all reason and logic, God accepts me because of what Christ has done for me. I know that though every time I sin, I deserve God's sword of justice. I deserve his boot to squash me like a bug. I know that every time I sin, I deserve that, but I know Christ was bruised for me so that all I have from God now is smiles. I know that the sin which I cling so closely to, I know it will not make me happy. I know Jesus will truly make me happy. That's the knowledge of salvation that John came to bring and Jesus came to provide. Jesus came to bring salvation to his people. Has God given you the knowledge of salvation? I don't care what you know in your mind. You have to know some here. That's not what I'm talking about. There are many people who know the truths of the gospel, but they don't know it in their soul. They don't know it in their heart. They don't experientially know it. Just having good thoughts and you understand the gospel in your head, that doesn't mean anything. Unless it goes to the heart and you trust the Lord Jesus from the center of your being, Unless you trust Jesus and submit to him, you don't have the knowledge of salvation. You may have the intellectual knowledge, but you don't have the knowledge that John came to bring and Jesus came to buy. Keep looking to Jesus Christ as revealed in the scriptures. And if you say, I don't know, maybe I only have an intellectual understanding of this, then ask God to make you alive. Ask God to give you an experiential understanding of the truths that you already know in your mind so that you would know that Jesus is your Savior and your King. Eleventh, we must praise the Lord because Christ brings forgiveness of his people's sins. All this, you see how all this is building? Prepare the way for salvation, and salvation includes the forgiveness of sins, the forgiveness of iniquities. Look at verse 77. This knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins. Here's the promise of the gospel, and here's why you must praise the Lord. Because Christ 
brought and bought the forgiveness of your sins. Notice that he does not say the forgiveness of sins in general, but Zechariah is singing a very pointed song to God's people. How do I know if I'm one of God's people? You trust Jesus Christ. That's it. That's how you know. You don't wonder if your name is written in heaven. You look to Jesus Christ, trust in him and what he's done for despicable people like us, and all who believe on him will never be put to shame. That's how you know. Zechariah's song is so pointed, and it must be so pointed to the truth. Notice that he says, the forgiveness of their sins. We must praise the Lord because Christ brings forgiveness of his people's sins. Isaiah chapter 40, which is that chapter we get John the Baptist's promise of being the prophet. That whole chapter is packed with parallels to Zechariah's song. And in chapter 40, starting with verse 1 and verse 2, the Lord is speaking through Isaiah and says, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Cry to her that her iniquity is pardoned. The Lord says, comfort, comfort my people. Cry to her, he's saying, Isaiah, cry to my people. Lift up your voice to my people, telling her, your iniquity is pardoned. Has your iniquity been pardoned? Do you have the forgiveness of your sins against God? You can look to no other place but the cross of Jesus Christ if you want to know that your sins have been pardoned. If you will not trust in Jesus' work and your place, taking your shame, guilt, and the wrath of God that you've earned, you do not have forgiveness of sins. Your iniquity has not been pardoned unless you look to Christ crucified and trust in His work. And if you do, with a simple faith, trust in Christ crucified and raised from the dead, that he is the one that provides the forgiveness you need because he was punished as you deserved, he was killed as you deserved, if you trust in him, your iniquity is pardoned. And what does that lead to? Praising the Lord. When God forgives a sinner, he does not bring their sin up again. When God forgives someone for Christ's sake, he doesn't keep bringing their sin back up. He is the perfect forgiver. Never throwing your sins back in your face. He has promised, I will remember your sins no more. Now, it is impossible for God to forget something. This is what we call an anthropomorphism. It's some, God speaks like a human so that humans can understand. That's all it is. God cannot forget anything And in fact, God's never actually learned anything. But God uses this language to say, this is what it's like when I forgive you of your sin. I will remember your sins no more. I will put them as far as the east is from the west. Children. Look at me. When God forgives you of your sin, when God says you're forgiven because of what Jesus has done for you, he puts your sins as far as California is from Florida. 
Now you go home today, children, and you ask your parents to show you a map so that they can show you as far as the east is from the west just in our United States of America. And parents, you show your children what the Lord says. I remove them as far as the east is from the west. Give them a picture of the Lord removes their sin from them and that the Lord promises he will never bring it up again. I will remember your sins no more. Beloved, look at me. The sins you cannot forget, God has promised not to remember. Praise God for the forgiveness that is in Jesus Christ. When was the last time you were sinned against? And some time passed and you brought it back up to the person who sinned against you. Some of you immediately look to the ground when I ask that question because you're ashamed. When was the last time someone wronged you and you forgave them and then you brought it back up to them? That's not forgiveness. God does not forgive like that. The good news for you and me is that God is not an imperfect forgiver like we are. God says, I will never bring them up again. My son paid for them. They went into the grave with him. And when he came out, they did not. When was the last time someone did that to you? Who said they forgave you and then they throw your sins back in your face. God does not do that, saints. He will never bring up your sins again. He will only remind you, comfort, comfort my people. Cry to her, her iniquity is pardoned. Have you been pardoned? Then praise the Lord. And go and forgive like he forgives. When someone hurls your sins back in your face, just be reminded that, praise God, that the Lord does not do that to me. And when you're tempted to bring sins up and hurl them back in people's faces, be convicted and repent, restrain from that, remembering God does not do that to me. I'm not going to do that to others. We must praise the Lord because Christ brings forgiveness of his people's sins. Now look at the first part of verse 78. I mean, can this passage get sweeter? Yeah, it can keep getting sweeter. I think Zechariah, once he mentions his son and then knowledge of salvation, that's great forgiveness of sins and then he goes up higher the tender mercy of our God the tender mercy indeed you must praise the Lord because Christ is the culmination of the tender mercy of God Christ is the culmination of the tender mercy of our God Look at the first part of verse 78, and you can follow Zechariah's logic. Why does God send John to prepare the way to give us knowledge of salvation, the forgiveness of sins? Why? Because of the tender mercy of our God. Because of the tender mercy of our God. Again, Isaiah 40. There's the parallel Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned. Do you know that Christ is not only merciful, but he's tenderly merciful? It's not just him on his throne saying, I'm not going to give you what you deserve. I'll be merciful to you. But he came down his throne. 
And he entered into human history so that he could take on flesh and he could come to each of us and say, come to me. For I am gentle and lowly of heart. I will give you rest for your souls. Christ is mercy made flesh. And his mercy is a tender mercy. I think one of the most tenderly merciful things that the Lord Jesus says is when he takes a passage in Isaiah and he says, that's about me. And it's imagery, it's metaphor for how the Lord treats his people in his tender mercy. So, oh, beloved, think of the tender mercy of the Lord Jesus when he says, A bruised reed I will not break, and a faintly burning wick I will not quench. Can you see that imagery? You look at a stock coming out of the earth, and it's bruised and bent. And Jesus says, I will not look at that bruised reed Say, so why is it bruised? Break it off. He says, no, no, no. I'll take it, bring it back up, and I will hold it there till it can be straight again. A bruised reed I will not break. And a faintly burning wick, this is the image of a candle that is just about to go out. It has almost nothing left. It's a faintly burning wick. And Jesus says, I don't enter the room needing light for the room and this faintly burning wick that's doing no good. I don't go over to it and say, psst. He says, no, that faintly burning wick I will not put out. The promise is is that he's going to put fuel under the wick to cause it to burn brighter. This is the tender mercy of the Lord Jesus. And so I ask you personally, because of your own sins, or because of the sufferings that you've experienced in this life, can you say, I feel like that reed that's bruised? If you don't feel that in this moment, you will feel that at some time in your life. Either because of your own sins and grieving over your still indwelling sin that you want to put to death and just seem to keep failing at. You'll feel it because of that or you'll feel it because of the sufferings and afflictions that you experience in this life. Can you say or when you say, I'm a bruised reed. You hear Christ from heaven saying to you, I will not break you. Do you feel in this moment like your fire is just about to go out? I don't know if I can carry on. My sins are great. My sufferings are great. I don't know if I can keep going. Then you are the faintly burning wick. And the Lord Jesus says, I will not let you go out. Look at the tender mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. A bruised reed I will not break, and a faintly burning wick I will not quench. Do you feel like your weaknesses are too great, too Do great things for Jesus' glory? Then look at the tender mercy of the Lord Jesus who says, My power is made perfect in weakness. So boast all the more gladly in your weaknesses and trust Christ to give you the strength. We must praise the Lord because Christ is the culmination of the tender mercy of our God. 
Christ is mercy made flesh, so look at him and find all the tender mercy you will ever need. Thirteen, we must praise the Lord because Christ is the sunrise that has visit us, visited us from on high. Just notice this metaphor. The point is that Isaiah 9, 2, those who dwell in a land of deep darkness, those who are darkness, on them suddenly a light has flashed. That's Isaiah 9, 2. That's also Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1 and verse 2. Right here the point is, look at verse 78, halfway through. Whereby the sunrise, that's the Lord Jesus, the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. Oh, what great reason this is to worship the Lord. Darkness covered the earth and thick darkness engulfed you. And then the sun rose. Do you see the point of Jesus being called the sunrise? At this point in history, Zechariah is saying, Jesus hasn't been born yet, but what he's doing, we're all dwelling in deep darkness in our own sins and miseries, and Christ coming to the earth is like the sun rising on the world. And that's also a metaphor for how God saves sinners. That if you're not yet in Christ... You are darkness. That's what Paul calls unbelievers in the book of Ephesians. You are darkness. And what you need and what you have, if you have been saved by God, the God that said, let there be light, said that to your heart. And the Lord Jesus rose as the sunrise and shined into your heart and onto your path so that you who once dwelt in darkness and in the shadow of death would have light and life. Listen to what the sunrise the Lord Jesus says in John 8, 12. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Christ is the sunrise that has visited us from on high. Therefore, praise the Lord, because each of us individually used to only live in darkness. But then the sun rose. What this calls us to do is remember who we were before God saved us, and who we are now being united to Christ by faith. We were darkness, and as Paul says in Ephesians, now we are light. Can you remember who you were before God saved you and then think about all the blessings in Christ that you have now, that the sunrise has shown upon you, Can you think about those things and not worship the Lord? I think no. It would be impossible for a believer to think about, I was darkness. I am light because of the sunrise. Eh, But I don't really want to worship the Lord. I don't think that's even possible. So meditate on who you were, who you are, because the sun rose to give you light. And worship the Lord because of it. Lastly, the 14th thing I believe we see in this song is that we must praise the Lord because Christ guides our feet into the way of peace. This is how the song ends. The culmination of all of the work of the Messiah to save us, to deliver us from our enemies, give us the knowledge of salvation, forgiveness of sins, the tender mercy... Because the sunrise rose, the culmination, the point of it all, is to guide our feet into the way of peace. Do you want peace? 
Do you individually want peace? Do you want peace in the world? Do you want peace in your family? Do you want peace in your own heart? You cannot look for peace anywhere but the cross of the Lord Jesus. If you want to get peace from anywhere, you look at the cross. You look at what Jesus accomplished on the cross, and you hear him saying now from heaven, My bride has peace with my father. I have died for her sin. You hear Christ saying from heaven, My people have peace with one another. I died to reconcile them. You really want peace? You hear Christ saying from heaven, My saints have peace even within themselves. I have died to give them inner peace that surpasses understanding. If you want peace, you hear Christ saying from heaven, My kingdom will conquer the world. I died to purchase that peace, and I will guide their feet into the way of peace. You want peace? Look at Christ crucified for us and see all of the promises that come flowing from his wounds on that tree. I'll finish with Isaiah 60, verses 17 and 18. Here's the promise of what the sunrise who visits us to redeem his people. Here's the promise of what he's doing. This is what Jesus is doing even right now as he saves sinners and sanctifies his saints. Isaiah 60, 17 and 18. I will make your overseers peace and your taskmasters righteousness. Violence shall no more be heard in your land. Devastation or destruction within your borders. You shall call your walls salvation and your gates praise that's what jesus is doing and he says go and disciple the nations baptize them teach them to do all that i've commanded you and the promise is i will guide your feet into the way of peace i will make your overseers peace and your taskmasters righteousness. Look to Jesus Christ and find the peace that you really long for. All you have to do is look. You look to him in faith and you will live. Father God, we thank you for your promises in your word. Help us to sing from our heart like Zechariah and say, blessed be the Lord God of Israel. For all of these reasons that you've shown us in your word. Strengthen us. So that we may worship you in the splendor of holiness. Not only now as we worship you publicly with your saints. But as we leave this place. And offer you the only reasonable worship that we can. And that is to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to you thank you for the tender mercy of christ made flesh thank you for the forgiveness of our sins that you've promised to never bring back up thank you for the knowledge of salvation that we have not only in our intellect but in our hearts thank you for the sunrise that has visited us from on high Lord Jesus, I ask you to help us to know you more, to love you more. I ask you to rise on the hearts of those who are still dead in their sins so that they may have the knowledge of salvation. They may know your tender mercy. They may know deeply the forgiveness of sins that you have pardoned your people. Help us to worship you in holiness and in righteousness. And we ask in the name of Jesus that you would abolish abortion. Purify your church. Save sinners. 
and sanctify your saints so that you may be glorified in all things. That is our only desire, is that you would be glorified. So glorify yourself. And it's in the name of the Lord Jesus we all pray. And if you agree with that, would you say amen? Amen.